Soon as I graduated from high school, the desire to act seized me. <laughs> Every summer I left the job I was in and went and did summer stock, came back to New York and got another job. In New York, the actors go and visit the offices of the agents to see, or at that time we did, to see what was being cast. So you used a lot of shoe leather. First Broadway show was In the Summer House by Jane Bowles. And it uh, brought me a great deal of attention because I had a very nice part, which is it's a great showcase for me. I was never a leading lady, never fitted that category. Um, so, you know, I played bag ladies and anything else <laughs> you can think of. I played secretaries and the like. I was a woman who ran a, a boarding house, or else at least a house where, an apartment house where I rented rooms. And uh, there was a man in one of my rooms because of what I saw in the house and heard, I, uh, I marked him as the, as the murderer. And the actor who was playing that role was Carol O'Connor. <laughs> But then I never saw him again until years later. <laughs> this is in the series. My agent called me to come up and see Norman Lear about this part in the series. I had never done a series. Norman said that he'd seen me in Damn Yankees. That's how I came to his attention. I don't know their names, but I know that he saw every character actress in town. Uh, for this part, he read everybody. And that's uh, how I got the part. I remember reading the script, which was the script, basic script for three pilots and the first show on the air. And I, I was just amazed by its quality. Really good script. Character, uh, comedy based in character and situation and so forth. And I thought to myself, wow, this on TV, how wonderful. Even then I thought that. She just had a zinger about one line a page that just broke his hot air every time. It was a laugh. And uh, so I think I said it in a quite a, a wry and wise manner, knowingly, you know, a zinger. <laughs> Burst his bubble. And that's the way I played the first, the pilots, and the which was, became the first show. The character evolved in the first 13 weeks, as it did for all of us. I didn't even use the nasal quality in my voice in that uh, first reading, no. But of course, when we got into rehearsal, and the fact that we were in New York, where I knew everybody hurried, and the uh, abusive uh, demands on Bunker's part uh, pushed Edith into a run. <laughs> she was hurrying to get things on the table, etc. That's how the little run um, rose and uh, became a part of the character. And I added the uh, nasality because I had used it in, in um, Damn Yankees for the woman for comic purposes. And I thought, well, I'll give her that nasality. I'll steal it from myself. <laughs> a very compassionate individual, a peculiar um, way of arriving at uh, things and <laughs> thoughts, not very bright, not uh, well-educated, and a perception about people that was instinctive, <laughs> intuitive. And sometimes it was very, very sharp understanding. She went right to the root of something. Just a lot of love, uh, unselfish love. On the surface, he was that, uh, that uh, <laughs> incredible, uh, ignorant bigot. But of course, she saw more than that. Edith saw uh, they were they were in love. She was in love with this man, and of course. I guess they had, we had some tender moments that were dramatized, perhaps more 
off camera. <laughs> Carol is a very fine actor, great versatility. And uh, that shows so much in his other work. And I think he followed uh, Mickey Rooney as a candidate. Norman saw him in something. He was perfect, couldn't have been better. ABC dropped it, the pilot it had, and uh, CBS picked it up. And Norman came along and said, it looks like we've been picked up. And he said, but don't, don't celebrate until you're there in the studio making it. <laughs> Nothing is certain. Very, very bright, very creative. Uh, and always pushing you further than what you think is your best work. Always. He was very much the uh, captain of the ship. And then, of course, spin-offs began to take place, and he got very busy with those, so he wasn't as active. He was active, though, in, in the, uh, the final day and uh, making suggestions, even so, with our show. Through the years, we made three tapes of it. Always trying to get that one line, G, our old La Salle ran great. We did it, oh, we just pronounced that so distinctly, but uh, they didn't get it. They could not understand, mostly because most people never heard of a La Salle, that make of automobile. <laughs> it was like doing theater. And I was very comfortable in that. Uh, that that laughter just feeds you as an actor, and um, it it was just a wonderful thing to do. It was like stepping into almost theater. And if uh, something was not in character, we were allowed to discuss it, and then go back and fix it. Wonderful free theater. Our director. John Rich and again Paul Bogart said you are in a free theater, enjoy it. It was very honest and very funny and uh, uncovering a lot of uh, bigotry and prejudice and nonsense and it was wonderful. Uh, it was real life and it was true and it was contemporary and uh, brought up issues too. I love that. We talked about almost every issue that was current. One of my favorite episodes was uh, Thanksgiving, I believe, and uh, Rob's part uh, brought home a friend who was a draft dodger. Well, uh, there was an explosion at that dinner table when Archie Bunker finds out that he's a draft dodger. Marvelously uh, acted seen and written, very effective, and went right to the heart of the discourse regarding the draft dodger and their motives. Civil rights issue went right through the series with our black neighbors, and uh, I mean, that was marvelous, marvelous stuff, Un uncovering bigotry and, and uncovering it with humor. There's nothing like humor to burst what seems to be an enormous uh, problem. Humor reduces it to nothing and wipes it out. I was bothered, I didn't want to, uh, I didn't care to dramatize it. But we, so we had a little talk. I said, I just don't like doing this whole show. And, uh, and he said, well, it's not about breast cancer. It's about love and how she is providing for the family and, and comforting them. And I said, oh, of course. <laughs> and so I was able to do it with uh, pleasure and, uh, you know, uh, ease and peace. After eight and a half years of doing it, immediately thereafter, I mean, truck drivers would call at me if they spot me on the street <laughs> and yell out, eat it. In other circles, I made sure to turn down any parts that would, uh, that would suggest the character of Edith Bunker because I didn't want to be buried, you know, and typecast in that kind of part. And also it would limit my opportunities for employment. 
So I worked on that, and I know there was one commercial they wanted me to do for some kitchen product. They really wanted Edith Bunker in that kitchen, but I said, no way, sorry, thank you. And Carol Burnett's show, or Sonny and Cher, I remember turning down a couple of things that had changed the name, but it was a sketch, and it was Edith Bunker. No, thank you. I only saw it once while we were making the series. I'd look at it critically, and that was it. I never watched the show thereafter. But now, with all this time that has elapsed, I can watch totally uh, objectively, and uh, I love it. Um, and I and I laugh. I think, oh, and I think, gee, that's good. <laughs> You know, I, of course, left the show uh, a year after Sally and Rob had left. I had decided uh, we'd done everything we could, and uh, it was time to go on. Archie Bunker's place, which went on for four years, Carol chose that. Uh, they wanted to expand the stories, get him out of the bar where it was usually set, and uh, have him date women so they have a, a greater variety of scripts. And then Norman called, and uh, he said that he could not say yes to allow Edith to die, you see, in a script, so that Archie could get on with his life. So I said to Norman, Norman, you realize, don't you, she is, uh, is only fiction. There was a long pause, and I thought, oh, I've heard this dear man that I love so much. And then the voice came back, to me, she isn't. CBS was obligated to one film under my contract, and about the same time, a, a splendid uh, P PR fellow named Dale Olson um, said, you should play Eleanor Roosevelt. And, and then a disc jockey in the Valley said the same thing, so that got me interested. Four writers later, and maybe about two years later, we had a script that was acceptable to CBS, and it went on the air in 82. And that was the beginning of my journey with Eleanor Roosevelt. It didn't seem to be the kind of role I could really get my teeth into. Those in charge are rather rigid about changes, which I had discussed, and I thought, well, it would be a hard row. It wouldn't be the free theater that we had enjoyed in the series, and I thought, this isn't for me now, at this time. We liked that a lot, both of us, but it didn't go in the direction that the film on which it was based um, presented. Um, it just wasn't going in the right direction um, in terms of the lives of these two women. I think that probably Whoopi would attest to that. But uh, we did about four, and then we had a, maybe it was Thanksgiving week vacation. When we got back, uh, they had decided to cancel, and we were overjoyed. Because <laughs> it was going to be a, a battle. I think it did at the time. But it, it didn't, certainly, it hasn't affected it now. I mean, it's taken another turn. Some people say you couldn't put our show on now, but it is on in cable. <laughs> it's so fresh and real and true and contemporary, even now. <laughs>